Our first speaker has tackled one of the toughest and most important issues that we face today, that's mass violence, mass killings, and uh, school shootings. So it is my extreme pleasure and privilege to introduce to you uh, Dr. James Densley. He's the professor and department chair of criminal justice at Metro State University. He's received global media attention for his work on street gangs, criminal networks, violence, and policing. In fact, we actually saw him on CNN mm -hmm. and then we bought his book. Yep. He's per perhaps best known for co-creating the largest, most comprehensive database of mass shooters in the United States. And it's known as the Violence Project, which is also in relation to the author of this book, which is an award-winning book, which is How to Stop the Mass Shooting Epidemic. It's a good book. I read a lot. One of the best, probably the best book I've read this year. Yeah, great, great book. book. So go read the book. Um, so in, in, in addition to this book, he has, I think, over 150 articles, chapters, essays in leading scientific journals, mainstream outlets such as the LA Times, Times Magazine, Wall Street Journal, Washington Post. It's a long list you can read online. Um, James uh, actually earned his PhD in sociology from the University of Oxford. Oxford. He's also, I think why we love him so much, he's also a former middle school special education teacher. So we share those things in common, our love of teaching. In addition to all of that, which is impressive, um, when Derek and I reached out to him to tell him about the work of our STML students, he has been nothing but generous and gracious uh, to share his time and his expertise with us and with them. So without further delay, it is truly my honor and privilege to introduce to you, Dr. James Densley. Thank you so much. It's uh, it's an honor and, and a privilege to be here and be with you all. I'm delighted to be able to, to share our findings from the Violence Project here today. So I'm just gonna uh, share these uh, slides uh, here as we get started. Hopefully everybody can see that okay. Uh, is, that, is that working okay for everybody? Great, I get the thumbs up. I think I'm good to go. Um, <clears throat> So I have to confess that uh, I uh, don't believe myself to be any expert in systems thinking. Uh, I've needed convincing from this uh, wonderful group of people on this call that what I'm doing fits within the mold, so to speak. Um, and I want to explain that disclaimer, which is to say that a lot of my research prior to studying mass shootings was in the areas of gangs and gang violence. And there is a seminal gang scholar by the name of Jim Short, Sh who was a American Sociological Association and the American Criminological Society, which is very rare that someone would have both those roles, which shows he's a real giant in the field. Uh, he passed away just a couple of years ago, unfortunately, at, at a, at a, in his 90s. So he had a very, very long career. He was still attending those conferences into his 90s. But uh, Jim Short famously published a paper in 1985 talking about a level of explanation problem in criminology. And then he followed up that original paper with a presidential address to the uh, American Society of Criminology in 1996, which became this paper in 97, talking about levels of explanation and how in the area of gang research there was a real gap. We were pretty good at explaining the individual personal characteristics that drove gang membership. We were also pretty good at explaining the macro sociological context within gangs operate, for instance in social systems and in culture, but we kind of missed where the action was, so to speak, which is in the group dynamics of the gang itself. Because at the end of the day, a gang is not just a bunch of individuals, but it actually has its own group dynamic. And so this was a way of explaining that we have to understand phenomena at multiple different levels. So as a criminologist and as a gang researcher, this really stuck with me. This idea that we have to look for the different levels of explanation and apply that to whatever it is that we are studying. So I think I came to this research with that in mind. 
but also as a former special education teacher in a middle school in the New York City public schools, as a practitioner. And as was mentioned in the uh, build up to uh, this talk here this morning, we want to link theory and practice because they are inherently intertwined. And so this idea that the work that you do can have a role in informing practice and policy recommendations and so on, I think was another big driving factor in this work. So in our study, The Violence Project, um, we have sort of a central thesis, which is captured in the opening chapter of the book, which is titled Monsters. Now, there is a prevailing wisdom in American society that mass shooters are monsters. Now, there's no question that they've done monstrous things, that they have, in some cases, perpetrated some of the highest profile and most devastating crimes imaginable. But before the person was the monster or the madman or inherently evil is what we often hear from the talking heads on the media, that person was somebody's son, somebody's brother, somebody's classmate, somebody's colleague, somebody's neighbor. And if we'd have recognized them as the human being that they were prior, to picking up the gun and perpetrating the crime, then there's a real good chance that we could have prevented that mass shooting from ever happening. So the lens of the monster, the framework of the monster, is actually what has been blinding us to possible solutions. Because what it's enabled us to do is explain away the phenomena of mass shootings. And worse, it's enabled us to actually pit against each other what we see as being imperfect solutions, but then dismissing them because they're imperfect. And so we then end up doing nothing. And that has been America's policy response to this problem for a long time. And we want to try and change that. Which brings me to the final chapter of the book. The final chapter of the book is titled Hope. After spending five or six years immersed in the lives of mass shooters, you would think that I'd be pretty jaded and pretty hopeless, particularly because whenever I switch on the news, there seems to be yet another mass shooting, more thoughts and prayers from politicians, no action, and the cycle continues. But I'm here today to tell you, just as we wrote in the book, that we still have hope because mass shootings are not an inevitable part of American life. They are preventable. And this is a framework for moving us toward prevention. So a little bit on the methodology and how we got to the findings. This project is a mixed method study. It began with the creation of a database of mass shooters. We define a mass shooting as four or more people killed in a public space. And it's not a crime that's related to underlying felony criminal activity. So it's not a drug deal gone bad or a robbery gone bad or a gang related shooting. This is that indiscriminate event when somebody walks into a school or a church or a retail establishment and opens fire and kills innocent people. Four or more killed is that threshold. We built a database going back to 1966 of anybody that fit that definition. We currently have 194 individuals in that database, and we've coded them on a number of different life history variables. So access to firearms, whether or not they played violent video games, whether or not they were using psychotropic medications, whether or not uh, they have mental or physical health challenges, their performance in school, the location of the shooting, you name it, it's in there. And it's also an evolving document. It's all available for free on theviolenceproject.org. You can download it, you can interact with it. But better still, we get feedback from the public who ask us, why didn't you include this? Or are you sure that that's correct? And we go back, we fact check it, and we improve and update the database. It's now in its sixth iteration, and it will soon be in its seventh when we release the next version of it in the coming months. And what I can tell you from the database alone is that mass shootings have grown more frequent and they've grown deadlier. And there's lots of ways to display this. You can control for population, of course, because the United States is bigger now than it was in 1966. But even if you do that, you still see this trend line. The one in front of you is a five-year rolling average of these events. 
Mass shootings are still relatively rare events when you think about the grand scheme of gun violence and the many forms of gun violence in the United States, but we have been seeing them grow more frequent and that routine and that cycle of mass shootings is becoming more routine over time. So there was a time, for instance, where we might have only got two or three of these events in a given year, but now we average five or six of these events in a given year. And that's why we sort of feel like we're in this constant cycle of mass shootings. And as I mentioned as well, in addition to the fact that there are more shootings, these shootings are also becoming deadlier. Now, part of this is inherent in the fact, well, if there's more shootings, then of course, more people are losing their life to the shooting. It's just math. But there's actually something that I think is a bit more compelling about this when you break down the shootings by type. And that is this chart here, which again, I apologize for the small writing, but I'll explain it. This is 100 years of the deadliest mass shootings in American history. So the deadliest shooting that occurred in 1903 killed nine people. So that became the benchmark for the deadliest mass shooting, nine people, 1903. And then you go through, 1923, my bad. You go through all the history going forward, and everything you see here is where we get the change point of the deadliest shooting. So that shooting in 1966, which is the benchmark for our database, for instance, was a shooting at the University of Austin, uh, Texas at Austin, uh, where 15 people were killed from a sniper at the top of the bell tower at that campus. Now, here's the thing I think that's most important about this chart. The deadliest shooting on record presently is the Las Vegas, Nevada shooting in 2017, where 60 people were killed, and by some estimates, over 800 were injured. Every bar on this chart in front of you that is in red is in the last 10 years. So this is over 100 years of mass shooting deadliness and everything in red is the last 10 years. So when we talk about mass shootings becoming more frequent and deadly, it's not just that the lives lost because of the frequency, it's because the events themselves are breaking records consecutively through those years. Now I mentioned it's a mixed method study. So in addition to sort of documenting the trajectory of mass shootings, we also wrote to incarcerated mass shooters. These are a small sample because many mass shooters, which I'll talk about later, die on the scene. But the thing that you have to just keep in mind with this is these are some of the most high profile mass murderers in American history. Getting access to them is very difficult. In some cases, we had to go all the way up to the governor of the state to get approval. And getting access to them was even more difficult because of a global pandemic, which shut down our entire society. And so a lot of our work was done via letter correspondence and via telephone interviews. But we exchanged letters sometimes 20 or 30 different times with individuals for them to ask, uh, answer questions about their childhood, their mental health, their physical health, their upbringing, and so on, to understand their life histories. In addition to interviewing the perpetrators, we also interviewed people that knew them. So we interviewed their parents, their siblings. We interviewed people who had been uh, on the scene and survived these mass shootings. We interviewed first responders. We tried to come at this from as many angles as we possibly could. We also spent entire weekends sometimes with parents who would lost loved ones to these tragedies to understand the phenomena from lots of different angles. So we have this working model in our research about the pathway to violence. People often ask us, what's the profile of a mass shooter? There is no profile. I can't give you a checklist and say that if you fill out these boxes, you're going to be a mass shooter. It doesn't work that way. It is a complex problem. And that's what it lends itself to the type of systems thinking that we're here to do today. For too long as well, Politicians, practitioners have tried to just put it in a simple box to say it's either mental health or it's access to firearms. It's an either or proposition and never the two should meet. 
what we need to do to truly understand and in our view prevent mass shootings is to embrace the complexity of the problem. So our working model is that many mass shooters have early childhood trauma, unresolved trauma. It's often physical, sexual abuse, suicide of a parent. There's a lot going on, bullying in the lives of these individuals early in childhood that's unresolved. We also see that mass shooters have in common an identifiable crisis point, which is a noticeable change in their behavior from baseline that overwhelms their usual coping mechanisms. It's often a suicidal crisis, and it's at a point where the grievances that these individuals have start to fester and that they start to look for violence as a solution to their problems. Which brings you to the next piece, which is around what we call social proof. Social proof is a psychological concept, but it's about looking for models of behavior to inspire you to the actions that follow. Violence is very much scripted in American culture. Mass shooters actually study other mass shooters. That's something that we found. And they can get radicalized to this type of violence in online communities. And then finally, you have opportunity. You have to have access to firearms. You have to have access to people and places in order to perpetrate these types of crimes. Now, here's the key thing. For so long, we've been obsessed with the idea of opportunity as being the only way to prevent a mass shooting. So this is why we fortify our buildings, why we build metal detectors, bulletproof glass, run our kids through run, hide, fight, active shooter drills, why we are fixated on the access to firearms as being the one and only solution to this problem. We're all in the opportunity box. But each one of these boxes are inflection points in the life histories of mass shooters, and each one is an opportunity for intervention. We can get upstream of the problem if we look at the way in which it is more deeply embedded and complex. And so here's an attempt at a sort of systems thinking way of looking at this issue. If you take each one of those boxes, trauma, crisis, social proof, opportunity, and then you think about what are the contributing factors that speak to how somebody gets to a mass shooting in those areas and how they all intertwine and are interconnected with one another. So take trauma, for instance. Trauma is rooted often in the family structure. It means that a lot needs to be done in pre and postnatal care, in child care and so on. In fact, we have often seen substance abuse problems in the parents of mass shooters. So there's something there around substance abuse. There's bullying in schools. There's dis disconnection from schools, which also contributes to this phenomena. And then it's also about getting people access to the treatment and care that they need. So there's lots of ways under that trauma bracket we can intervene upstream, which might have an impact later in life. For the crisis, the crisis is often generated by cultural norms within American society, particularly around masculinity and to the extent in which somebody measures up to those expectations. There are organizational triggers for the crisis point. They often re uh, result in a workplace shooting, for instance, if you've been fired from work. This speaks to HR processes, this speaks to the ways in which you are treated, the organizational justice within your uh, workplace environment and within your community. There were, of course, societal triggers for mass shootings. Our lack of faith in our institutions, for instance, that we don't trust scientists, we don't trust journalists, we don't trust the police, we don't trust politicians. Well, in a society where your institutions feel fragile and failing, it's no wonder that people take matters into their own hands, that they become mobilized toward this type of violence. So this speaks to our need for better coping mechanisms, our need for better mental health treatment, but also our need to reduce the stigma around getting access to those mechanisms. And of course, just the availability and affordability of those mechanisms as well. We have in the United States a very broken mental health system, which would take way too long of my time this morning to describe, but it's a very 
uh, complex and, uh, and, and interesting problem to the extent where our largest mental health providers in the United States are jails and prisons. That's how failed the system is. Then you think about the social proof aspect. So I am an individual who has trauma and is in crisis and is having all this messaging sent toward me. I'm now asking myself, why do I feel the way that I feel? And so what you do as a human being is what we all do when you have those big questions. You Google it, or in this society, we chat GPT it. But the idea is that you go searching for models of behavior. And this is where individuals become incentivized into violence, because in the darkest corners of the internet, mass shooters are heroized. They are celebrated. This is viewed as a way to become instant famous, that you can become a celebrity because of your actions as a mass shooting. Now, not only that, but there is also in some of these areas an, a facilitation and enhancement effect of the internet, where people become literally radicalized into violence because they find ideologies that explain the way they're feeling and give them a sense of purpose and meaning. There's a mimicry and copycat component to these events where mass shooters study other mass shooters and then they follow suit. And all of this, by the way, is layered on top of a wider, in the United States, gun culture that markets to angry young men the types of firearms that enable them to reclaim their masculinity and their control over their lives. Which brings us finally to that opportunity piece, the firearms and availability and accessibility. There are hundreds of millions more guns in circulation in the United States today than there were even two decades ago. Think about that. 200 million more guns in circulation today than there were even a couple of decades ago. That's 200 million more opportunities for one of those guns to just wind up in the hands of somebody that shouldn't have it. That's just math. And then you have the gun culture around this. You have the physical security components of this human error where people leave the door open or forget to lock the door or whatever it is that enables people to access into buildings. And then you also have the first responders, how quickly they show up how well-trained they are in medical emergencies and so on, which can dictate the outcomes of what becomes a mass shooting and what doesn't. Because if we define it as four or more people killed, well, in some cases, that might just be a matter of how quick you can get people to the emergency room. And so there's so many things floating around this phenomena. And I'll give an example of how these multiple feedback loops and interconnections contribute to the problem. The availability of guns makes it easier for individuals to commit mass shootings. This results in more deaths and injuries, which increases public fear and trauma. Now, we know that there is a culture in the United States that valorizes guns for protection. So when we're afraid, we purchase more firearms. It becomes more socially acceptable to engage in this type of a violence. It feeds back on itself. And they'll give another example. We have mental health issues. This increases your susceptibility to that type of radicalization online that I talked about. In the United States, we have inadequate access to mental health services. That makes it more difficult for those individuals to get treatment for those mental health issues, which can increase in turn their risk of violence. Or we have weak gun safety laws, particularly in some states in the US. It makes it easier for individuals to access those firearms. If there's a resistance to gun control measures, which is fueled by cultural and political factors, individual freedom, the Second Amendment Constitution, for example, that makes it more difficult to implement the type of effective solutions to this problem of mass shootings in America. So there's multiple connections, multiple feedback loops. It's not just an individual and a gun. It's much more complicated than that. And it's about embracing the complexity to get us toward the solutions. So that's going to be my focus here over the next sort of uh, 10 minutes or so before we move into the Q&A, which is to walk you through the steps that I just talked about to find those commonalities that move us toward policy and practice, which is a big theme here today. So who are the mass shooters? 
when you really break it down, what is their dynamic? Well, mass shooters tend to be men straight off the bat. So our interventions perhaps need to be keeping that in mind. The culture of masculinity, patriarchy, and so on does feed into this phenomena. 97% of the individuals in our database are all men and boys. Mass shooters also tend to be, at least in many settings, insiders, which changes the way we think about the problem of mass shootings. I mentioned before the monster. The monster is the scary outsider. You can lock the door and keep the monster out. At least you, we think we can. But the problem is that when the case of school shooters, college and university shooters, place of worship shooters, workplace shooters, these are individuals who are inherently connected to those institutions. School shooters are current or former school children. So you can't just lock them out. They walk through the security doors every single day. They're not surprised when the school resource officer is hanging out because they walk past that individual every single day. The active shooter drill is not new information for them. They've ran through it five times a year every day since pre-K. That's over 70 times by the time you get to 12th grade that you have gone through a training to tell you that you might be murdered in your classroom. For some individuals, that might be good preparation, but for others, that might be inspiration for how you circumnavigate the security within the building. So it changes the way we think about who these individuals actually are. They're right there in front of us. We just need to intervene accordingly. As I mentioned before, these shooters are also in crisis. And a crisis is noticeable. It's a change in behavior from baseline. So you have to know somebody's baseline to know when it changes. But we see the manifestation of a crisis in increased agitation, abusive behavior, a losing touch with reality, depressed mood, mood swings. There's lots of warning signs and many of these mass shooters have multiple warning signs. So if we are attuned to the warning signs, can we get upstream of this problem and divert people off of that pathway to violence? We profile those signs of a crisis in detail. Each one is actually laid out in this uh, piece that we wrote for the New York Times. If you're interested in a little bit more about that, then I recommend this as a way of kind of getting uh, some, of that, some of that information. Mass shootings are a final act. I think this was a big aha moment for us when we were doing the research. You don't perpetrate a mass shooting really with the intent of getting away with it. It's a different type of calculation for crime. Many mass shooters are actually suicidal prior to the event, it's about a third of these individuals. Many intend to die in the act. They write in their manifestos that I will die this day. It's the entire purpose. And about 60% of the individuals in our database do die on the scene. They either take their own lives or they're killed by law enforcement. A mass shooting is a spectacle. It's intended to be watched and witnessed, but it's also intended to be a final act. And that again changes our calculation. You put an armed guard on the door to protect yourself. That might not necessarily be a deterrent to somebody who is suicidal. It might actually be an incentive. So give this as an example. This is a school shooter from 1979. And she was asked at the time of the shooting, why did you perpetrate the crime? And famously, she said, because she hated Mondays. And that became a song, in fact. But when she was asked later in life at a parole hearing, why did you perpetrate the shooting? She said, because I wanted to die. I was trying to commit suicide. Then why did you pick the school across the street? And she said, because I know if I fired on the school, the police would show up and they would shoot and kill me. Every time I tried suicide in the previous year, I'd screwed it up. What are the implications here? Well, the implications are that we can take a lot of learning from suicide prevention and apply it to mass shooting prevention because there's an overlap between suicide and homicide in these cases. We can look at the way in which our mental health care system, our suicide prevention techniques, and so on, can actually inform 
the practice of dealing with this more kind of wicked and vexing problem. The other thing is that mass shooters study other shooters, as I mentioned, and they also leak their plans when they're doing this. We've studied the mechanisms behind this leakage, and we find that it corresponds, A, with the younger the shooter, the more likely they are to talk about it, but also if they have a history of prior counseling, suicidality, mental health concerns, they're also more likely to talk about it. We think of this as being an example of a cry for help and an opportunity again for intervention, that the trail of breadcrumbs is there. It's on social media. It's in people's correspondence and in their communication with these individuals, but it's about knowing what to do with that information and how best to intervene. And then of course, there is that access to firearm piece. And I wanted to share this with this audience because I think it speaks to a lot of different dynamics that are going on with this phenomenon. Yes, it's easy to say the United States has permissive gun laws. It's easy to get access to firearms. There's a mathematical piece to this where there's just a lot of firearms in circulation and so on. But there's also something that we've noticed over time in terms of the changing dynamic of the gun violence, which is to say that mass shootings generally are perpetrated with handguns. And throughout history, that was always the weapon of choice for mass shooters. But that has changed, particularly in the last decade. And we've done the math on this around, is it correlated with the federal assault weapons ban? And you can see that on the chart here, which is not very illustrative. It doesn't seem to be aligned. But the last decade is the piece that's most interesting to us. In that period, we've seen a real increase in the use of AR-15 assault style weapons. And I think there's two things going on with this. Number one, the weapons are more readily available, widely marketed and accessible than they've ever been. And there is something about the utility of that weapon if you're gonna perpetrate a mass shooting, which means that it is deadly. But then again, every semi-automatic weapon is deadly in the wrong hands. That's what a gun is designed to do. Whether it's a handgun, assault weapon, a rifle, it's deadly. Where we think the action is on this issue is in the copycat phenomenon. If you want your mass shooting to be the spectacle, to conform with the genre conventions of what a mass shooting looks like in the United States, then you use the same props that the other performers of these events have used previously. And the AR-15 style assault weapon is that prop. This is why the most recent shootings we've seen seem to all look alike. Individuals dressed in tactical gear, body armor, with AR-15s attacking public spaces. There's a mimicry and copycat component to this, which is explaining the rise of this type of violence. In the last three years post-pandemic, 60% of mass shootings in our database were perpetrated with an AR-15 style assault weapon. That's an astonishing rise from all throughout history. It's been about 20%. So the last couple of things I wanna share with you before we go into the Q&A, which is um, that during the pandemic, you probably heard about the layers of Swiss cheese analogy. Now, you know, what's interesting is we were using this analogy before the pandemic. We wrote about it in the book and then it became popular during the pandemic. And now we can claim no credit for it whatsoever. But the idea is that Swiss cheese has holes in it. And if you layer Swiss cheese on one on top of each other, the holes start to fill in and you get toward a more perfect solution. And I think that's really the key takeaway from our work in the area of mass shootings, which is to say there is no one solution that solves this problem because of all those systems that I talked about earlier. It's to do with mental health. It's to do with guns. It's to do with gun culture. It's to do with the Internet and social media. It's to do with families. It's to do with all this stuff. And there's no one thing that's going to fix it all. What the politicians have done, though, for the last at least 25 years post-Columbine and probably longer, 
it said that because there's no one thing we can do which solves this problem, we'll do nothing. And that's not good enough. So what we have to do is embrace the complexity here, be grown-ups about it, and recognize that even though there are holes, when you layer them on top of each other, the holes start to fill up. So in the book, what we try to do is document different solutions that work at those different levels of explanation that I talked about at the beginning of this presentation. My inspiration from Jim Short back in my gang research days. What are the things that we can do right here, right now, to try and prevent mass shootings at the individual level? And that might be as something as simple as if you have a firearm in the home, store it safely so a teenager can't get access to it. Because over 80% of school shootings are perpetrated with guns that are stolen from family members. So what are the things we do as individuals that can have a difference? Then we also layer on top of that what we can do as institutions to potentially solve this problem. So if you're working in a school or in a workplace or in a community, what are the types of things that we could do that might have an impact on this? Some of this is around situational crime prevention, but a lot of it is just around how do we engage people into uh, the policies and practices which are best going to help them. And then we structure solutions at the societal level. These are the big system pieces that might need an act of Congress to truly be realized. But again, layer them on top of one another, recognizing that there's not one solution here, there's multiple. That we can build a stronger safety net, we can provide people with the care and support that they need throughout the life course so that a, life, a mass shooting doesn't seem like a solution to one's problems. Some of this is around firearm policy, which is where it gets more contentious in the United States. But a lot of this is also around the types of things which are just gonna better and improve lives. And I know that I am pretty much out of time. So I've got two things I wanna say, which is this. The next presentation, my understanding is these wonderful graduate students have taken these recommendations, and they have tried to uh, survey to find out which ones people think are the most palatable and the most workable. And I'm super excited to learn about that. Because one of the criticisms of our work has been, you didn't give us the hierarchy of solutions, you just gave us the solutions. To which my retort is, because it's complicated. There is no hierarchy, you've got to do it all. But still, we'll let the grad students uh, figure that out. But I will end on this. Everything I just said can help stop a mass shooting epidemic. But it also has a diffusion of benefits as well. The things we've just talked about can help improve lives in multiple different ways. It can help prevent a suicide. It can help prevent bullying in schools. It helps preventing somebody who's lonely and isolated going tumbling down the rabbit hole on social media and getting radicalized into an extremist hate group. It can help provide support for a family that's struggling and doesn't know how to provide good care and compassion for their children. It can get people through the day, which sometimes is all it takes to get people through the crisis point that is underpinning the mass shooting. Sometimes a simple act of kindness can be all it takes to get somebody off of that pathway. So do we do these things just because they solve the mass shooting problem? No, they're a good excuse to do them, but we do them because they're also the right thing to do. And they have a massive diffusion of benefits beyond just the mass shooting problem. So with that, I think I'm right on time, I hope. And uh, it is a real pleasure to be here. It's been great connecting with the team at Cornell, the grad students and everybody. It's really been just a wonderful experience so far. And I'm very grateful and very happy to answer any and all questions. So thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, James, for your talk and, and for your research. Can everybody hear me? Yeah. Okay, good.
uh, and and for making so much of it available to the public. Uh, that's a that's a particular ethic that I encourage for more scientists to do, uh, because the public oftentimes is paying for the science, so we should get it out to them, and and it's important that they understand it. So thanks for doing that as well. So. Um, I'm pretty much globally, people are interested in the issue of mass killings. And uh, if you wanna delve more into James's work, you can visit the theviolenceproject.org or read the book, like we said, which is fantastic um, to learn more about your studies and your recommendations specifically. But I wanna take this opportunity to talk a little bit less about what you studied. Uh, and more about how you studied it. Uh, and because as we as we discussed, and as you mentioned, you didn't even know about systems thinking. But when we saw your work, it struck us as a near perfect example of the kind of research and policy recommendations that are needed, um, data driven, empirically grounded and systemic. At the same time, it's also compassionate and human, which is also an important thing to, to remember. Um, so you have the largest database on mass violence ever assembled. You've done interviews with victims, offenders, family members of mass killings. Your research seems to recognize that it's always what, what, what is always true about complex systems and wicked problems, that they're the result of a web of causality. And your data-driven recommendations represent a web of solutions. And we can't, as you mentioned, isolate any one recommendation from the others and expect results, webs of causalities, webs of solutions. So your 12 recommendations on page 186 of your book um, is a remarkable summary of your research in terms of what we can do. And that's really the hope part, that there's something that we can do about it uh, because we're all you know, somewhat sick to our stomach of, with concern about it. But but we we need that hope to be able to do something. So um, speak a little bit to this idea that that a web of causality requires a web of solutions generally and specifically to the to the to the issue of mass killings. yeah, i I, uh, I agree. This was something I think that um we benefited from the fact that my co-author and colleague throughout this entire project, Gillian Peterson, is a psychologist by training. And so we collaborated on another number of projects. But, you know, as a psychologist, and she's a forensic psychologist, you're often focused on those individual factors of what's driving a particular phenomenon. So you're very much interested in and her research agenda prior to this work was a lot around mental illness and violence and the overlaps there or not. Um, and, and these questions around the kind of individual factors that might be underpinning a mass shooter's behavior. And of course, I'm a sociologist by training. And so when we first started even talking about this project and thinking about what it might look like, you know, Jill was like, well, we've got to include mental health in the variables and this type of stuff. And I'm like, yeah, but we've got to include, you know, the societal stuff. You know, we've got to include the internet and social media and access to healthcare and, and, and these types of things. And I think that was incredibly beneficial to have these two perspectives, the sort of the micro and the macro coming together and recognizing like, oh yeah, that would contribute, you know? And I know that that might sound sort of intuitive, but I think so often we get very siloed in our disciplinary uh, expertise and, and our frameworks that you, you don't know what you don't know. And so if you're a psychologist, and of course you're gonna come at this thinking like, well, let's look at mental health. And if you're a sociologist, you say, well, let's look at the guns. That's what happens on CNN every night, right? It's let's talk to this talking head who tells you it's the mental health and let's talk to this one who tells you it's the guns and we don't get anywhere. So our big benefit was maybe we join forces, right? And we, we come together. So then in the course of the research, looking at it through those, those lenses of it being both and embracing that complexity basically from the onset, 
enabled us to really then start to pick apart this kind of web of causality, um, recognizing that it wasn't this just linear path and it wasn't a checklist of, 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 uh, of, of a profile for a shooter, but there was real complexity there. And I think the human stories were what really brought that to life for us. So you can see it in the database and you can control for your variables and this thing. And of course, you've got challenges that these are rare events. And so you've got all the statistical issues that go, go with that, which is why largely we just use descriptive statistics because there's an element of the simplicity of being able to communicate to the general public without needing a PhD in data science to be able to understand what it is I'm saying. Mm -hmm. um, so there was this component, but I think the human stories were the piece where we realized, wow, that's complex. So, you know, when it was, um, when we interviewed a mother of a mass shooter, for instance, who's dealing with, can I grieve for my son? I feel guilty for the crime. She's basically living in hiding. Um, she's trying to also parent her siblings who were being attacked on social media. There's a whole host of things going on in that life. But one of the things that really stood out that she said to us was, what would you have me do? Call 911 on my own son. And we sort of said, well, with hindsight, yes, because that could have saved a lot of lives. But I think what she was trying to convey is that she didn't feel trust in the police. She didn't think that the police response was necessary because she didn't, she knew something was wrong with her child, but she didn't know that it was this. And so she was looking out at the landscape of options and thinking, well, what's out there? All yeah. I do is pick up the phone, call 911. That's not the solution. So there, right in that conversation, just that one sentence, you realize there's the gaps. Like, yeah. we don't know who to call. This is more than just a police response. It needs to be layered. And then you start realizing there's the complexity. There's that web of causality. There it is right there. You've got a mom here that had an opportunity to intervene. She didn't feel safe going through the mechanisms that she thought were available to her. And then a tragedy happens. Yeah. So that was that kind of web of causality, I think, that we the, the human interest stories really uh, elaborated upon that for us. Yeah. Yeah, I love that. I love uh, you You tell the story uh, about, you know, when you get on CNN or Fox or whatever, uh, that, that they always want you to order them in rank order, you know, or wh which one comes first. And, and you also talked about politicians because there's because there's no one thing, they do nothing. And um, one thing that I've seen, not only in this issue, but in lots of issues, we see it all the time in K-12 education policy and things like that. The, the alternative to doing nothing is, well, we try one thing when we need to try multiple things at once, a web of solutions. And then that one thing doesn't work in isolation. So we give up on that one thing. We say, oh, it didn't work. And then we've actually gotten ourselves in a hole because we tried something that would work if it was tried with a web of solutions, but now we believe that it doesn't work, right? So it's either we try one thing and then, or nothing, or we try one thing and we give up on it, but we never really try the whole thing. Uh, say a little bit more about, about the, like your experience on the, these news networks and them kind of trying to get you to... Oh. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's that's very, very true. I think there is an element of trying to make the narrative packaged in a way that is palatable to the audience and to the framing that they put around this. And that's the other thing that we've noticed is that many of these mass shootings, they, they want them to fit some sort of framework. So there's this unhealthy obsession with motive, which I think in some cases is really problematic, which is we will interrogate for days, why did they do it? And then it's sort of, well, they were a white supremacist. So that's it. Now we know, that's it. Don't need to worry about it anymore because we can, we can put it in that box. It fits that box. And to me, I'm like, yeah, but why did that person find white supremacy compelling in the first, yes, place? In the first because, place? Because when I go on that website, I don't all of a sudden think like, yeah, I should probably kill some people, right? That's not how I interpret yeah. that stuff. I find it abhorrent. I find it 
and ter terribly offensive and racist and sexist and so on. So what's going on there that they find that narrative compelling and that's because they're in their own little crisis and right. they're trying to make meaning of their life. And they, and they, but what ends up happening is we say, well, they did it because they're a white supremacist. So now we know. Yeah. And then it's sort of like, and breaking news, here's something else that we'll just talk about. And you think to yourself, well, all that has done has got people thinking, well, well, I'm not a white supremacist. So it's, I'm not the problem here. Right. So we don't need to worry about it anymore. And and you think and and again I'm using white supremacy as an example, but there's there's you know whether you're an incel and, and it's a misogynistic crime or what you know an involuntary celibate that's the uh, that's the thing or whether or not uh, you've been mobilized because you were fired from work or something. Well, the reason why he did it was he was fired from work. Okay, that's great, but people are fired from work millions of times every day, and they don't, they don't go and shoot the workplace so something else is going on here beyond that and i think it's about embracing a little bit more of that complexity the politician piece i think you're exactly right which is even when we do something we don't do enough and then when the something doesn't work we then abandon it and that's really a sad reality with this yes. of, of being able to try and actually do multiple things at multiple times i will give a quick shout out to i live in uh, the Twin Cities in, in Minnesota in the United States uh, presently, although I'm originally from England, but I, I live in, in the Twin Cities. And this year, the, um, the Minnesota legislature is putting together a very comprehensive package around public safety, but also around education and around health care. And they're doing it all at the same time. And this is a byproduct of they have democratic control of the House, the Senate, and the governor. So there's no opposition. So right. they, they can just do it, <laughs> which is one thing. And again, it doesn't matter if it's Democrat or Republican. You, if you control all three, you can put legislation through. The other thing is Minnesota had an $18 billion surplus. So they had money to spend. So it was this sort of like perfect environment of we have money and we have control. Well, now we can do some things. And so... This will be a very interesting experiment to see what this achieves for Minnesota when you look at some of the outcomes that are important here yeah. around healthcare, education, access to firearms, and so on, because they're doing a lot of things at the same time. And they're, they're, they've really adopted a kind of systems thinking to this, which I think is quite rare and quite unique. Um, and um, you know, we've we've been a little bit involved in some of that stuff, but we can't claim credit for it. There's just a lot of people right now who are recognizing that you can't just do one thing in isolation. This has to be a, a total package. And, and I think that's yeah. exciting. That's great. Uh, so one thing that I was thinking about, there's a there's a saying uh, by Plato, I think it's well begun is half done. And we, we say this a lot to uh, in systems thinking and to our, our students and, and people we're training in this, because oftentimes our biggest, most influential biases occur right at the beginning of our analysis. And, and so we don't even notice that they're part and parcel of the rest of our analysis. I sort of say, like, if you put poison in the, at the root of the Nile, then it's going to affect everything downstream. And I think it's really interesting that you started your book with monsters because in in a way in a way that is like our first lens and our first bias which which biases and causes us not to see reality yesterday we talked about loving reality and seeing reality we actually because of that first bias we don't see everything downstream because we're already wearing these lenses uh what do you think of that what like what, what does that make you Oh, I love the analogy. I, I, um, I wish we'd used it in the book. Um, it's, uh, <laughs> but yes, I, that was exactly the reason why we opened the book that way. Um, and it was interesting. We, the reason we just, the book opens, the, the opening uh, paragraph of the book, the opening page of the book is the interrogation of the Parkland shooter. And there is a moment in that video which got leaked on YouTube. I mean, 
you don't get me started on that but you can watch the entire interrogation video all i mean it's hours long 20 hours long and it's all on youtube but there's a moment in that video where that individual's half brother comes into the interrogation room just to sort of tell him like what have you done and then the shooter completely breaks down and and he's bawling his eyes out and he's shaking uncontrollably and he's just he's in a total panic crisis state and it was one of our students actually that discovered that because in the course of our research you know we had these these largely undergraduate students that were helping us and they sat and scrolled through 20 hours of interrogation video that it might be useful for the database and they happened to stumble upon and discover this moment and that was the moment where it was like we've labeled this individual as this monster but here they are as this broken teenager sobbing uncontrollably and it was like there's still some humanity there which i know is pretty scandalous to say after this is an individual that murdered 17 people um but for us we were looking at that and thinking that's the blind spot yeah. that's that's it because nobody recognizes that this could be your son or your brother or somebody. We just kind of dismiss it. And so we wanted to open the book with that monster's piece because for us, that is the biggest blind spot is we still to this day will hear politicians, uh, talking heads on the media and so on saying, this guy's just evil. Yeah. Well, the thing about that is there's no policy for evil, right? There's no, you, you just, evil people will do evil things. There's nothing we can do about it. And it's an easy kind of get out of jail free card in that debate. It's, I mean, don't get me wrong. They've done a sort of evil deed. I get it. I understand the framework, but I don't think it's helpful from understanding the systems and understanding the solutions. So for us, we wanted to kind of exercise that, yeah. uh, that demon um, in order to then reframe the problem of mass shootings in a way that could enable us to get closer toward the solution. So for us, it, that was the blind spot that we needed to erase. Yep. Yeah, you also mentioned um, um, the idea that it's kind of an either or, it's mental health or guns. And, um, you know, we talk a lot in systems thinking about the both, the genius of the both and versus the tyranny of either or. Um, and we're actually going to see this very, in, in, in data and, and otherwise uh, in the next presentation. But it's interesting to me that, um, I know you, you might not have been on yesterday, but uh, when Dr. Ian Cousin was talking, but he does this amazing research on, uh, you know, uh, collective behavior. And he was talking about how, how these insects and fish and things like that will make, uh, will bifurcate the decision as they get closer to it. So, you know, if they're going left or right, they'll bifurcate or make a binary decision. And it, it's quite possible that we use this as an evolutionary strategy to sort of like to, to make it clear between the choices, even though mm -hmm. when we stand back further and get perspective, there are, it is not a binary choice. And uh, I just, I wanted to point that out because I wanted to make the connection between what you're saying and what you're experiencing, what Dr. Cousin is talking about and what our next presentation is going to actually show you the findings for, which I'm very excited uh, to, to, uh, to see the next presentation, that, that this either or kind of thinking might be very much built into our brains. And uh, you know, so I, we need to I almost resist it. it as a bias. I believe it. And also sometimes as well, I think politicians um, are often left with, I need something I can sell. I need yes. something I can sell to my constituents. I need something I can sell to the, the legislature or whatever it is. And complexity doesn't sell well um, <laughs> is, is, is a challenge. Um, so one of the things I think we've been trying to do uh, with our work, uh, for better or for worse, I'm not suggesting it's perfect, but is making the data publicly available, trying to be as data driven as we can in our conversations. Um, 
and and really trying to sort of make accessible and simplify what is this complex problem. That's been a real goal of the violence project, the website, the work we've done with the media and so on. It's it's how can we change the narrative around this phenomena in a way that it becomes more accessible to everybody? Because then I think the constituents can start to demand the type of changes of the politicians that are, are really needed to address the problem. So that's that's a big goal of the work that we've been doing. Dr. James Dendley, thank you so much. Uh, we have to wrap this session now, but uh, yes. really appreciate your talk and your work. And your time. Today. And your time today. And, and no, it's my pleasure. Thank you so much.